Dead America, The Militia of St. Mary's. Part 2, by Derek Slayton. Day 0 plus 4, 8.37 a.m. The downtown streets of St. Mary's bustled with frenetic energy, teeming with the hustle and bustle of survival. Scores of individuals navigated through the thoroughfares, transporting essential supplies to their assigned destinations. In one corner, a clothing emporium buzzed with activity as several people meticulously inventoried both new and pre-owned garments. A makeshift laundry area at the rear ensured that all items brought in from homes were thoroughly cleaned and inspected for quality. Adjacent to the clothing store, a group of individuals diligently unloaded crates brimming with foodstuffs into a nearby general store. Despite the apparent abundance of provisions, the task of feeding the several hundred survivors in town loomed dauntingly large. Further down the street, a vacant storefront had been repurposed into an impromptu butcher shop. Inside, two rugged men toiled tirelessly, expertly processing the carcasses of deer freshly brought in by local hunters. In a corner, a cooler housed a bounty of freshly caught fish, providing a welcome addition to their dwindling food supplies. Despite the temporary relief provided by the addition of game meat, the specter of starvation continued to haunt the community. Across the street, Tatum, still acclimating to his role as the community's leader, stood vigilantly on the corner. Managing the militia compound and the town with its limited resources was no small feat, yet Tatum approached the challenge with a determined resolve. As Tatum surveyed the scene, Eric approached with a cup of coffee in hand, breaking the momentary silence. Morning, Tatum. How are we looking today? Eric inquired, offering the steaming cup. Turning to face Eric, Tatum nodded appreciatively, taking a sip of the warm brew before responding, better than expected. Hunters had some success this morning, and those fishers aren't messing around. Took three people to unload their haul. Eric chuckled, a glint of admiration in his eyes. Look at you, a fish in every pot. Tatum couldn't help but chuckle, shaking his head in disbelief as he took another sip of his coffee. Good God, Eric, how did it come to this? Tatum questioned, his tone tinged with both amusement and incredulity. You mean the zombie apocalypse? Eric replied. No, I mean me being a politician, Tatum clarified, his lips curling into a wry smile. Both men shared a moment of dark humor letting out a somewhat horrified laugh at the realization of their current predicament. At least there hasn't been an election, Eric remarked. Yet, Tatum added, a note of uncertainty in his voice. Look at the bright side. It's unlikely anybody would run against you, Eric pointed out, attempting to inject some levity into the conversation. Why do you say that? Tatum inquired, genuinely curious. Because who in their right mind would want this shit job, Eric retorted, his words punctuated by a sardonic chuckle. Tatum chuckled softly, returning his focus to his coffee as they continued to assess their surroundings. Suddenly, Reed appeared around the corner at the other end of the block, scanning the area before spotting them and waving as he made his way over. As Reed approached, Tatum and Eric couldn't help but notice the exhaustion etched on his face. Sweat cascaded down his brow, his attire smeared with dirt and grime. Despite his worn-out appearance, Reed exuded an upbeat demeanor, a smile gracing his lips as he made his way toward them. Well, look who rolled out the right side of the bed this morning, Tatum quipped, a hint of amusement in his voice. Sleep is for the weak, boss. I haven't been to bed yet, Reed replied with a grin. Tatum shot Reed a puzzled glance. What have you been up to? Been working on the barricades, Reed answered matter-of-factly. Tatum shook his head, a touch of disappointment evident in his expression. I thought I said no activity outside after dark. We don't know who or what are in those woods, and we don't want to risk attracting their attention. Relax, Tatum. I wasn't out in the open. Well, I mean I was, but I was inside the confines of that junkyard on the edge of town. Been having some fun too, Reed reassured him. So you cooked something up? Tatum inquired, intrigued. Oh yeah. The owner, Eddie, had a few dozen bundles of rebar that I repurposed. 
took most of the night, but when I combined those with a couple rust buckets and one of his welders, I got us some badass rolling barricades, Reed explained proudly. Tatum and Eric exchanged a glance, acknowledging the ingenuity of Reed's creation with nods of approval. Got them in place yet? Eric asked. Got one set up on the eastern flank. I put it in the middle of the road about 20 yards away from the center of our barricade line. I figured if we got a mob of those things, they'd get stuck on that, and it would break them up. Make it hard for them to get enough force behind them to break through, Reed reported. Sounds as good as anything. How about the western flank? Tatum inquired. Just about to head over there and check if you wanted to join, Reed offered. Tatum glanced over at Eric, silently seeking his assistance. Would you mind checking with the butchers and coordinating the catch of the day into the rations? Tatum asked. On one condition, Eric replied with a mischievous grin. And that condition is? Tatum inquired, curious about Eric's terms. When you become president, you don't make me your vice president, Eric joked. Tatum chuckled at the jest, shaking his head in amusement as he motioned for Eric to proceed with the task. Eric nodded in agreement a smile playing on his lips as he walked away to fulfill his assignment. Reed, who had been observing the exchange, approached Tatum with a quizzical expression. What was that all about? Oh, just coming to the grim realization that I'm in charge of way more than I ever intended, Tatum replied with a hint of resignation. Better you than me. But don't worry, you're rocking it out so far. Kept your people safe and brought a lot more into the fold, Reed reassured him. It's still just surreal, Tatum admitted, feeling the weight of his responsibilities. The dead are running around and eating people. But you being in charge is surreal, Reed remarked, raising an eyebrow in amusement. Tatum chuckled softly, nodding in agreement. Yeah, I know. If I was any more self-centered, I'd implode. Both men shared a laugh as they strolled across town towards the outskirts, a mere few blocks from their current location. The walk was serene, with only a handful of people milling about. Some seemed to be merely enjoying the fresh air, having ventured out of their homes. The power outage from the previous day prompted Tatum to suggest that the survivors make the most of the daylight while it lasted, and he was pleased to see many heeding his advice. Finally reaching the western barricade, they encountered two rows of cars spanning the highway, reinforced with welded metal beams to form a formidable barrier. The two tiers of vehicles stood about 15 yards apart, with half a dozen civilians stationed in the middle, armed with hunting rifles and vigilant in their surveillance. Reed's brother, Frank, oversaw the civilians and approached Tatum and Reed upon noticing their arrival. What do you say, Frank? How are we looking this morning? Tatum inquired. Glad you're here, boss. Got something out of the ordinary, Frank replied, his tone tinged with concern. These days, that doesn't really narrow it down, Tatum quipped as Frank handed him a set of binoculars. Okay, what am I looking at? Tatum asked, peering through the lenses. About a hundred yards down on the right, Frank directed. Tatum nodded, adjusting the binoculars to get a clearer view. Among the half-dozen bodies on the road, one zombie still stood. Are you going to do a trick shot or something? Why is he still standing? Tatum questioned, perplexed by the unusual sight. Look closely at him. What do you see? Frank prompted, his voice carrying a note of intrigue. Sighing, Tatum turned his attention back to the creature, scrutinizing it carefully. He soon noticed that the ghoul was ensnared in barbed wire fencing wrapped around its leg, hobbling along the street towards them. I see that you have him leashed up. What am I missing? Tatum inquired, puzzled by the creature's behavior. He's not running at us, Frank explained simply. Tatum gave Frank a quizzical look before peering through the binoculars again. True enough, the creature moved with slow, deliberate steps. I'll be damned. What did you do to it? Tatum asked, impressed by Frank's observation. Not a damn thing. Its buddies came running up a couple of hours ago, and we put them down. But then about 10 minutes later, this one came shuffling along behind them. I was about to put it down when I noticed it wasn't running, Frank recounted. 
How did you leash it to the barbed wire? Reed inquired, his curiosity piqued. I shot at the post and shattered it. That was enough to draw it over. Got a good laugh watching it get tangled up. Poor dude has been struggling for the last hour just to get back to the road, Frank explained with a chuckle. Come on, let's go take a closer look, Tatum suggested, his tone resolute. You can't be serious, Tatum, Reed protested. I'm very serious. If these things are slowing down, that's crucial information. We need to make sure he didn't just hurt himself, Tatum insisted. Reed and Frank joined Tatum in navigating over the cars, with Frank casting a glance back at the civilian guards. I don't want anybody taking a shot. Unless you see us hauling ass back here with 30 of those things on our tails. You good with that? Frank instructed, receiving nods of affirmation from the guards. He gave them a thumbs up before hitting the pavement and jogging up to the others. Approaching cautiously, the trio walked towards the agitated creature, their weapons drawn and poised, ready for any potential threat. They halted about 10 yards from the zombie, who thrashed and moaned in agitation. Standing in the middle of the road, they observed the creature closely, searching for any signs of trauma beyond the blood around its mouth. Okay, theories, let's hear them, Tatum prompted. Maybe he couldn't run when he was alive. Frank suggested. He looks pretty fit to me. Like he worked out and didn't skip leg day, Tatum countered. Maybe he got injured, had a bad fall, got hit by a car, Reed proposed. Do you see any signs of trauma? No bites on him, so he's most likely a virus victim. So he turned early, Tatum reasoned. Maybe they're breaking down physically, Frank suggested again. We just went over that. There's no trauma, Reed pointed out. No external trauma. I'm talking internal, Frank clarified. What are you thinking? Tatum inquired, intrigued by Frank's line of thought. I'm thinking that when these assholes see us, they don't hold back. It's zero to 102 seconds flat. That has to take its toll on the tendons and muscles, doesn't it? Frank hypothesized. Reed and Tatum shared a knowing look, acknowledging Reed's observation. Plus, there doesn't seem to be any blood flow that has to weaken them up a bit too, Reed added, further supporting their theory. Looks like we have a working theory, Tatum concluded. Sounds as plausible as anything else these days, Reed agreed. Let's just keep our fingers crossed that this is the case, Tatum remarked optimistically. I guess we'll find out the next time we run into a mob of them, Reed mused. Or the next time we see someone turning, we could handcuff them to a treadmill, Frank suggested with a hint of humor. As funny as that would be to watch, it might be better to just keep an eye on them whenever we come across them, Tatum responded. Tatum then took aim with his handgun, firing around through the zombie's head, ending its existence. Shortly after, they heard heavy footsteps and rustling leaves from the nearby woods, putting them on edge. Their tension eased when Edgar and Devin emerged, dressed in camouflage gear from head to toe. Everyone relaxed, lowering their weapons as the newcomers approached. What the hell was that? Edgar inquired, eyeing the scene. Sorry guys, just had one to put down, Tatum explained. You boys have any luck with the hunting? Reed asked, changing the subject. In a manner of speaking, Devin replied cryptically. The trio of men exchanged puzzled looks before Edgar broke the silence. Bagged a deer about a mile back, but we found something else, Edgar began. We took a field trip this morning, getting pretty far to the west of here, just to get a lay of the land, Devin added. What did you find? Reed inquired, curiosity piqued. We found a handful of survivors. They're holed up in an RV park just off the river, Edgar revealed. Did you make contact? Tatum asked, his interest growing. Edgar shook his head. No, they had too much company for the two of us to deal with. How much company? Reed pressed for details. About 30 of those things, Edgar replied grimly. What do you want to do, Tatum? Reed turned to their leader, seeking direction. 
It seems rude to just let them die. Let's go see if we can lend a hand, Tatum decided decisively. Chapter 2 Tatum, Eric, Reed, Frank, Edgar, and Devin assembled at the parking area behind the gun shop, each meticulously inspecting their arsenal of assault rifles, sniper rifles, and additional ammunition. So what do we know about the park? Tatum inquired. It's pretty sizable for this region, Edgar replied. We spotted at least 10 campers and a handful of regular vehicles scattered about. Where were those things congregating? Tatum pressed for more details. Everywhere, Edgar answered. Seemed like there were survivors inside the campers, and at least a few in the vehicles. Then where in the hell did that many come from? Reed wondered aloud. Could have followed them down from Spokane. Took them a couple of days to catch up, Eric theorized. Those things do have a one-track mind, Frank remarked. So how are we attacking it? Reed questioned. Sniper team on the outskirts, one vehicle straight into the fray, Tatum outlined. The sunroof seemed to work pretty well last time. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Sounds like a walk in the park, Eric commented casually. Tatum's response was sharp, his tone tense as he snapped his fingers. No, anytime we leave this town, it's anything but a walk in the park. You underestimate those things and you get eaten. Make no mistake. We're behind enemy lines, even when we're behind the barricades. And we're about to go poke the bear, so you better be on your game, because it's not just your ass out there. Eric contemplated the situation for a moment and then nodded, acknowledging his error. Okay, let's get moving, Tatum declared. The group piled into the two vehicles parked nearby, with Tatum and Edgar taking the lead SUV, while the others settled into the rear one. As they drove past the barricade and left the town behind, a palpable tension filled the air. Tatum gripped the wheel tightly, his demeanor betraying the gravity of the mission, a detail not lost on Edgar. I know we're taking it seriously, Tatum, but this is something we can easily handle. There aren't too many of these things, and there are plenty of distractions to hold their attention, Edgar reassured. It's not that, Tatum responded somberly. Then what is it? Edgar pressed. We're going to need you at your full attention out there. We're already on rations. What are we supposed to tell these people once we rescue them? Tatum's voice carried the weight of his concerns. That's outside my pay grade, brother, Edgar admitted. I'm serious, Edgar. I don't know what to tell these people. We don't have the resources to take them in. But if we turn them away then we might as well just put them down where they stand. I'm genuinely asking for your advice, Tatum confessed, his tone fraught with uncertainty. Edgar sat in silence for a moment, carefully considering Tatum's question before speaking, his words measured and deliberate. Before all this, I spent the better part of the last decade living on my own, Edgar began. I had a little spot way off the beaten path, and between hunting and my small greenhouse, I was self-sufficient until something went wrong that I couldn't handle. Like what? Tatum inquired, his curiosity piqued. A dozen different things, Edgar replied with a sigh. Generator went down one year during the summer, took out my freezer. Nothing I tried worked, and I lost three months' worth of food. I had to call in somebody to fix it. Couple years after that, just as winter was rolling around, I threw my back out cutting firewood. Took me damn near an hour to crawl from the pile back inside. Only had enough wood to last me a week, and that injury had me laid up for six. Fortunately, I had a phone that worked, so I was able to call someone for help. I'm struggling to see your point, Tatum admitted. My point is, people are just as important a resource as anything else, Edgar explained. It'll be painful, but we can ration for a while. But with people, we can build greenhouses, tend to the land, hunt, fish, do any manner of thing that needs doing. And there just may be some people in those campers who can do stuff that we can't. Tatum pondered Edgar's words for a moment before nodding in understanding. You said it yourself the other day. We're under siege conditions. We're not getting any new supplies. The same goes for talented people. We might be wise to treat this opportunity like the gift that it is, Edgar concluded. Okay, 
But just for the record, when we're all starving to death in a few weeks, I'm going to tell everybody this was your idea, Tatum quipped, injecting a touch of humor into the tense conversation. Edgar's laughter filled the air, causing Tatum to chuckle along with him. Joke's on you. I still have my little sanctuary tucked way out there, Edgar quipped. So instead of starving to death with us, you'll freeze to death next time your back goes out, Tatum joked back. Oh, I won't be alone. Surely there's someone in town or in this group that's looking for a ruggedly handsome man, Edgar retorted with a grin. Hate to burst your bubble, but so far the only single people I've seen are a couple of grandmothers and some young men, Tatum teased. If they can cook and carry firewood, they're more than welcome at my place. Edgar replied with a laugh. The two men shared a moment of camaraderie before snapping back into mission mode as they approached the turnoff for the RV park. Tatum halted the SUV just before it, signaling for the others to stop as well. He leaned out the window to issue his orders. Okay, I want you to get into your firing positions. Two-man teams, one shooter, one watcher. These things may be congregating around the campers, but some of them could have very easily wandered off into the woods, Tatum instructed. The other four men nodded in understanding, grabbing their weapons before rushing off into the wooded area overlooking the park. Devin led Frank deep into the woods, swiftly navigating through the underbrush to reach their position. After a few minutes of intense running, they arrived at an elevated spot overlooking the park, with the river flowing nearby. Watch our six. I'll cover the front, Devin directed. You got it, Frank affirmed. Devin swiftly set up a sniper rifle with a stand, positioning himself to observe the situation below. Clicking on his radio, he relayed the information back to Tatum. In position, do you copy? Devin radioed. I hear you loud and clear. How's it look down there? Tatum responded, his voice steady. Peering through his scope, Devin described the scene to Tatum. The campers are parked in three rows, pretty spread out horizontally from the entrance back to the rear of the open area. Those things are fairly spread out, but there's a heavy congregation right by the first camper, Devin reported, pausing briefly to consider his next move. Hey Reed, can you line yourself up with that group? Thin them out a bit before Tatum charges in, Devin directed. You got it. I'll be in position in just a minute, Reed confirmed. Good. We'll go when you're ready, Devin replied. Where should I park? Tatum inquired. Right in the middle of the lot. There's one camper in the center that none of those things are around, so it's probably empty. If you can pull them over that way, we'll be able to pick them off from our vantage point, Devin instructed. Okay, when we hear shots, we'll pull in. And guys, do your best not to shoot us, Tatum joked, eliciting some light chuckles over the communication channel before Reed brought their focus back to the task at hand. We're in position. Lighting them up in 10, Reed announced. The group settled in as Reed peered through his scope, finding the range on a creature at the back of the pack attempting to enter the camper. He squeezed the trigger, sending a round through the side of its unsuspecting head. Here we go, Tatum declared. Tatum hit the gas on the SUV, the tires squealing before finding traction. He fought to control the vehicle as it fishtailed momentarily, gaining command as they hurtled down the wooded pathway of the park. The path twisted and turned, revealing the campers and the approaching zombies. They watched as one creature's head exploded, the others searching in confusion for the source of the noise before being attracted to the sound of the SUV's engine. Hang on, Tatum shouted, his grip tight on the wheel. He aimed for the outer edge of the mob, plowing into several zombies, causing the vehicle to bounce violently. Despite the chaos, they managed to break through, veering down the center aisle and halting in the middle of the pathway. Tatum swiftly shifted into park, and Edgar began clambering through the sunroof to take up his position. Meanwhile, Tatum surveyed their surroundings, noting the mix of runners and shamblers closing in on the vehicle. Hit the fast ones first, Tatum commanded. Devin nodded, raising his rifle and methodically dispatching the creatures thrashing against the vehicle's sides. Within moments, the agile runners were neutralized. 
Turning their attention to the slower moving horde, Tatum rolled down his window, taking aim with his handgun and firing off rounds. As they focused on the approaching threats, the snipers positioned in the hills also did their part. The sound of gunfire echoed from a distance as the snipers picked off the zombies, one by one, with precision. Tatum grabbed his radio, checking in with the rest of the team. The center looks pretty clear. How are we looking on the sides? He inquired. The front end is clear. There's nothing left standing, Reed reported. Backside is clear, but we might have another situation, Devin added. Tatum tensed at Devin's revelation. Which direction, he demanded, his voice edged with concern. Tapping Edgar on the leg to draw his attention, Tatum ensured he was listening to the radio exchange. The river, Devin replied. Those things are swimming now? Tatum questioned incredulously. Not exactly, Devin clarified, peering through his scope toward the riverbank. He spotted a small group of people floating on inner tubes, drifting in their direction. They huddled together, bewildered, scanning their surroundings for the source of the gunfire. Looks like we have survivors taking a float trip in the middle of the apocalypse, Devin remarked wryly. Are we clear to the river? Tatum inquired, urgency creeping into his tone. Devin scanned the park once more, detecting no immediate threats. You're good, and I'll cover you in case they aren't friendly, Devin assured. We're on the move, Tatum confirmed. Exiting the vehicle, Tatum and Edgar dashed between the campers toward the river. As they passed the last camper, a middle-aged man poked his head out, shouting, Is it safe to come out yet? The man asked anxiously. Just hang tight until someone comes to get you, Tatum advised, his focus squarely on the unexpected survivors drifting towards them. The man nodded, retreating back inside the camper and securing the door. Meanwhile, Tatum and Edgar hurried to the waterfront, scanning the river and spotting the approaching flotilla. Tatum unleashed a piercing whistle, vigorously waving in their direction. After a moment's delay, the floating civilians finally reached the shoreline. Tatum and Edgar sprang into action, assisting in pulling the half-dozen people to dry land. They noted that the group was dressed in normal clothes, as if they hadn't planned on swimming. The group consisted of an even mix of men and women, varying in age. One man, Nash, stepped forward to address Tatum and Edgar. Thank you so much. I don't suppose you can tell us where we are, can you? Nash inquired. You're about 10 miles to the west of St. Mary's, Tatum informed him. Wow, I can't believe we floated that far. But we've been in the water for hours, so I'm not surprised, Nash remarked, a hint of exhaustion in his voice. Where did you get in the water? Tatum asked. This little place called Eddyville, Nash replied. Where the hell is that? Tatum questioned. Just across the water from Hayden, a suburb of Spokane, Nash explained. Tatum nodded, motioning for them to follow. Are you soldiers? Nash inquired. In a manner of speaking, Tatum replied cryptically. Then you have to help our friends. Please, Nash pleaded. Tatum glanced over at Edgar, who shrugged in response. You know my stance, Edgar added. Tatum let out a sigh, reluctantly nodding. Come on, let's get you dry, and you can tell us what's going on, Tatum suggested, leading the group away from the riverbank. Chapter 3 Frank and Edgar maintained their vigilance at the park's entrance, while Devin surveyed from the hills, armed with his sniper rifle. Despite not anticipating trouble, the echoes of gunfire during the assault urged caution. In the heart of the park, Tatum climbed onto the roof of his SUV, affording him a panoramic view of the emerging campers. Some attendees distributed spare clothes to those who drifted in via the river. Okay, everybody. Please gather around, Tatum called out, projecting assurance. It's okay. We're here to help. Reluctantly, the crowd converged. A diverse array of people spanning generations unified by exhaustion and dread. Can everybody hear me? Good, Tatum continued. 
his voice a beacon of hope amidst uncertainty. My name is Tatum, and my friends and I are from the town of St. Mary's, which is just down the road from here. Like you, we have faced a lot of hardships over the last few days. However, we have secured the town. It is completely free of whatever those things are. Relief washed over the crowd, manifesting in smiles and embraces. Now, we can take you there if you'd like, Tatum offered. But there are a few conditions. First and foremost, we're going to have the doc take a good look at each and every one of you. We know the bites are fatal, and we can't allow that into town. The crowd murmured agreement, their resolve unshaken. Secondly, Tatum continued, his tone firm, we are not providing a handout. There is a long laundry list of jobs and tasks that need to get done, and if you want to stay, you'll pitch in. Does anybody have any objections to that? Everybody shook their heads in unison, signaling their agreement, while a middle-aged man stepped forward, assuming the role of spokesperson for the group. Tatum, we really appreciate you coming to our rescue here, the man began earnestly, and every single man, woman, and child here will do their part. Okay then, that was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be, Tatum remarked, a hint of relief in his voice. Start gathering your things, and we'll be headed out shortly. As the crowd dispersed, Tatum leapt down from the SUV. Meanwhile, Nash approached, adjusting his ill-fitting dry clothes. Okay, Nash, so tell us about your friends, Tatum prompted. Before Nash could respond, Eric and Reed joined the conversation. There was a big group of us who saw the writing on the wall. Just before things got really bad, Nash began, recounting their ordeal. We had the idea of getting out of Hayden and down to Eddyville, where a lot of our friends' boats were parked. Figured if we could get out to the water, we might have a chance at riding this out. And it didn't go to plan, Tatum interjected, sensing the weight of Nash's story. That's an understatement, Nash replied solemnly. We got overrun at the bridge out of Hayden, lost I don't even know how many people, but enough of us made it to the docks. Only we couldn't even get to the boats. So many of those things were around it. A few people tried, but they ended up joining their team. How many of those things are we talking about? Reed inquired, his voice tinged with concern. When we left, easily a hundred, probably more, Nash admitted, his expression grave. Tatum regarded Nash with a skeptical gaze, his curiosity piqued. If there was that big of a crowd, how did you manage to escape? Nash fell silent, grappling with his emotions as he continued to speak. My sister gave her life so that we could make it to the water, he revealed, his voice heavy with grief. Tatum and the others exchanged concerned glances, realizing they messed up in pressing him. We spent three days in the car, Nash continued, his voice trembling with emotion. All of us packed into my SUV, and my sister, who had all of our supplies in her car, we were lucky to just get to the docks, but we were stuck like everybody else. My sister knew that we didn't have any water, and there was no way for her to get us any. If we stayed, we were going to die. Nash choked back tears, but pressed on with his account. So she motioned for us to follow her, he recounted. She floored her car, pushing through those things, creating just enough of a hole for us to follow. We tried to get out the way we came, but there was a camper that wrecked blocking the road. The only way out was the water. So that's where she took us. Those things were bouncing everywhere, but we managed to get there. Drove straight off the dock and into the water. Jesus, Tatum muttered, his shock palpable. I managed to avoid hitting her when we splashed down, but the creatures following us didn't, Nash continued, his voice trembling with sorrow. They swarmed her car as it sunk. She never had a chance. The rest of us managed to get out, though, and we started floating. It took a while, but we found our way down here. I'm sorry for your loss, Nash, and I'm sorry for implying that you weren't being truthful, Tatum offered, his tone filled with remorse. It's okay, Tatum. I'd probably look at me skeptically, too, Nash replied softly. But about your friends up there, I don't know if we have the manpower to help, Tatum admitted. You have to try please. You don't have to bring them here, but you can't just leave them to die. There's women and children trapped there, Nash pleaded. 
and they're all in vehicles? Tatum inquired. Most of them, yes. A few people got trapped in the store, Nash clarified. What kind of store? Tatum pressed for more details. It was a general store, had water stuff and groceries, Nash explained. Tatum glanced at Eric and Reed, noticing their interest peaked by the mention of groceries. How big of a store is it? Reed inquired. Decent sized. There was a small town there and they catered to visitors too, Nash replied. Give us a minute, will you Nash? Tatum requested and Nash nodded, stepping back to allow the trio to confer. A grocery store could be good, Eric suggested optimistically. Sounds dangerous as hell though. Hundreds of those things to deal with and a scared civilian population of unknown size. Even with these things slowing down, I'm still not a fan, Reed countered, his concern evident. Tatum pondered for a moment before retrieving a map from the vehicle, spreading it out on the hood of a nearby sedan. He located Eddyville, studying its geography intently, a peninsula surrounded by water on three sides, with a highway leading northeast toward Hayden, connected by a single bridge. As Reed and Eric peered over his shoulder, Tatum's thoughts churned. Eventually, he nodded decisively. Okay, we're at least going to go up and see what the situation is, Tatum declared. Reed began to protest, but Tatum raised his hand to silence him. I'm not saying we're going to embark on a rescue mission. But this place is what, 40 miles to our north? We're already getting visitors from there. We need to know what the situation is before we get surprised by something we can't handle, Tatum explained. You're right, Tatum. We do need to check it out, Reed conceded. Okay, get your gear, Reed, Tatum instructed, finalizing their decision. Tatum retrieved his radio, keying it up. Devin, are we still clear up top? He inquired. Yeah, there's a whole lot of nothing coming our way. If there's anything out there that hurt our shots, they're taking their sweet time getting here, Devin responded. Good, get down here. We're making another run, Tatum instructed. On my way, Devin acknowledged. Eric, work with Frank and Edgar to get these people back to town. Get them processed at the school. Make sure the doc gives them a once-over. Once he gives the thumbs up, find them a place to bunk down and get them comfortable, Tatum directed. I'm on it. What do you want me to do with these campers? Could go a long way towards fortifying those barricades, Eric suggested. Tatum pondered for a moment before declining. Keep them at the junkyard, but make sure they are fueled, geared up, and ready to roll at a moment's notice, Tatum ordered. Eric appeared puzzled. Tatum? You want me to refuel these things? I do. And stock it up with some food. Three days rations for 20 people each, Tatum confirmed. Seriously? Eric and Reed voiced their surprise in unison. We have a town filled with vulnerable people. There's a chance that one of these days someone is going to come our way looking for trouble. With these, we can get people to safety. And besides, we can always strip it down later if we need to, Tatum reasoned. You got it, boss. I'll take care of it, Eric agreed. Eric dashed off, leaving Reed and Tatum to study the map intently. Looks like the closest bridge is a few miles ahead of us. After that, it looks like it's straight up Highway 97, Reed observed. Tatum traced his finger along the road, noting its proximity to the river as it stretched northward. His attention lingered on a bridge crossing about 10 miles up the road. I see that look in your eyes. You want to do something there, don't you? Reed remarked, sensing Tatum's contemplation. If we can block that bridge off, that will cut off that highway, and anything trying to wander this way from Hayden, Tatum explained his strategy. Reed pointed to another highway running north and south, albeit a good 30 miles west of Hayden. We still have Highway 3 to deal with, Reed noted. One problem at a time. We're heading this way right now, so we should block it off if we can, Tatum replied resolutely. Reed glanced at one of the large campers nearby, sizing it up. We could always sacrifice one of these bad boys. Just park it across the highway at the bridge. It won't stop everything, but it should stop a mob, 
Reed suggested. Okay, go see if we can borrow one, Tatum instructed. I'm on it, Reed affirmed as he departed. Meanwhile, Devin approached. What are we looking at, Tatum? Devin inquired. Surveillance for sure. Possible rescue mission, Tatum briefed him. Sounds good. Load out? Devin prompted. Get every round you can from the other vehicle, and even from the guys staying behind, and talk to Nash over there with any questions you have. He was on site, Tatum directed. You got it, Devin acknowledged. Devin nodded and proceeded to gather information and ammunition, leaving Tatum to immerse himself once again in studying the map. Tracing his finger along the highway leading to the docks, Tatum furrowed his brow, overwhelmed by the weight of his responsibilities. He glanced over at the survivors, observing them as they gathered their belongings and bid farewell to their loved ones who didn't make it. Despite the heart-wrenching scene unfolding before him, Tatum steeled himself, grappling with doubt but ultimately resolving to do what was right. Okay, another death-defying mission. Let's do it, Tatum declared, his voice firm with determination. Chapter 4 Tatum and Devin sat in the lead SUV, cruising north towards their destination. Behind them, Reed struggled to maneuver the cumbersome camper, eventually resigning to simply occupying the middle of the road. Looks like he finally realized nobody was going to pull him over and give him a ticket for bad driving, Tatum remarked, glancing at Reed through the rearview mirror. Better late than never, I suppose, Devin replied with a smirk. As Tatum noticed Reed staring at him, flipping him off, he burst into laughter. Looks like he heard us, he chuckled, offering a playful thumbs up before refocusing on the road ahead. So, what else were you able to get from Nash? Tatum inquired. Just that it's going to be a shit show, Devin responded bluntly. Don't sugarcoat it for me, Tatum replied. Dozens of civilians, panicked and surrounded by things that want to kill them and us, Devin elaborated won't be the first time we've dealt with something like this. Doubt it's going to be the last, Tatum remarked, trying to maintain a sense of resilience. If we don't do this right, it will be our last, Devin retorted with a hint of harshness. Something on your mind, Devin? Tatum probed gently. Just concerned. That's all, Devin replied, his tone softening slightly. We have time. Share them with me. Tatum encouraged. It just boils down to we can't save them all. That's all, Devin admitted reluctantly. I know, and if it wasn't for the promise of the grocery store, I wouldn't have agreed to come up here. But even with the extra people, getting those supplies would be a net positive, Tatum reasoned. Look, Tatum, I'm not saying we shouldn't save people. It's just... Devin trailed off the weight of his words weighing heavily on him. Tatum stepped in, sensing the weight of his unspoken thoughts. I understand, Devin. I'm not a fan of letting people die either. But you're right, there's only so much we can do, Tatum acknowledged empathetically. Devin nodded in agreement as they rounded the next corner, their eyes falling upon the bridge ahead. The landscape was serene, devoid of any signs of danger or life, just an empty road and picturesque scenery. Upon reaching the other side of the bridge, Tatum and Devin exited the vehicle, observing Reed's struggle to parallel park the massive camper. It took Reed several tries to maneuver the behemoth vehicle into position, prompting amusement from both Tatum and Devin. Amidst laughter, Reed extended his arm to deliver a one-finger salute, eliciting even more amusement from his companions. Finally, the ordeal was over, and Reed successfully crossed the highway. As he emerged from the camper, Tatum and Devin applauded, offering him a mock ovation. Oh, eat me, you assholes. Let's see you drive something that size, Reed retorted. I drove stuff that big on a regular basis back on the farm, Devin chimed in. Yeah, well, excuse me for growing up in civilization. Are we going on our suicide mission or not? Reed grumbled. Tatum motioned for Reed to return to the vehicle watching as he stomped off and settled into the back seat. So when are you going to tell him that we need to pull it off the road since we have to come back this way? Devin queried. 
I just didn't have the heart. We'll save it for when we're on the way back. He'll love it, Tatum replied with a smirk. Or he'll jump in the river and swim home, Devin joked. Both Tatum and Devin burst into laughter as they returned to the vehicle and resumed their journey. For the next mile, the air was filled with silence, punctuated only by their suppressed giggles. Eventually, Reed reached his limit. Oh, for fuck's sake, just get it out already, Reed exclaimed. This prompted another round of laughter from both men, with Devin playfully smacking Tatum on the arm. You gotta tell him, man, Devin insisted. Tell me what? Reed inquired, growing increasingly curious. If you don't, I will, Devin threatened mischievously. Tell me what? Reed pressed, eager to know. You're going to have to move that thing when we come back, Devin revealed, unable to contain his amusement. Devin erupted into hysterics as Reed dropped his head in resignation, shaking it in disbelief. However, their laughter was abruptly cut short as Tatum slammed on the brakes, causing both men to lurch forward. Sorry, Tatum, I couldn't resist, Devin apologized, but Tatum remained stone-faced, his gaze fixed ahead like a deer caught in headlights. What is it? Devin asked, turning towards the front, only to have his own expression mirror reads when he saw the ghastly sight ahead. Before them lay a scene of horror. Wrecked cars littered both sides of the road, with zombies wandering amidst the wreckage. Some ghouls were attempting to break into the vehicles, while others roamed the streets aimlessly. Get your weapons ready. If you see a survivor, call them out, Tatum instructed, his voice steady despite the chaos unfolding before them. Do you want me up top? Reed asked, already anticipating the need for quick action. No, we may have to get out of here quick, Tatum replied, his focus unwavering. Reed nodded, and both men assumed their positions, handguns at the ready and hands poised over the window controls. As they cautiously approached the scene, most of the zombies remained fixated on the trapped cars. However, a few began to venture into the street, prompting Tatum to maintain a moderate speed to avoid collision. Approaching the first car surrounded by zombies, they peered inside to find two creatures trapped within, the undead drawn to the noise emanating from their struggle. Nothing over here, Reed reported. As Tatum continued driving, they passed several more vehicles, each telling a grim tale of death and desperation. Blood splattered on the windows, with one creature inside unscathed while the others bore the telltale signs of bite marks. These poor bastards didn't know they had a killer in the back seat, Devin remarked solemnly. What do you expect? The government didn't tell us shit, just kept their mouths shut until they skipped town. Left all of us to deal with this on our own, Reed lamented, his frustration tempered by resignation. It's just sad, man. So many dead because of their desire for secrecy, Reed added, his voice heavy with sorrow. Suddenly, Devin's tone shifted as he made a discovery. Holy shit! I think I got something, he exclaimed. Tatum slammed on the brakes, allowing Devin to get a better look. What do you see? Tatum inquired. This small sedan over here. No blood on the windows, but those things really want to get inside, Devin observed, scanning the vehicle for signs of life. After a moment of searching, he spotted a young woman, no more than 20, curled up asleep in the back seat. Is she alive? Reed asked, his concern evident. I know one way to find out, Tatum replied decisively. He laid on the horn, startling the girl awake. Frantically, she looked around before spotting the men in the SUV waving at her. Devin signaled for her to wait a moment, while Reed motioned for her to cover her ears in preparation for the noise to come. She complied, nodding in understanding. Reed swiftly climbed up through the sunroof, while Devin and Tatum rolled down their windows slightly. With precision and coordination, all three of them began firing their weapons in unison, dispatching the approaching ghouls with lethal efficiency. Tatum kept a vigilant watch on their surroundings, noting the growing mob of undead drawn by the gunfire. Get that side clear and get her over here, Tatum instructed, urgency lacing his words. 
Both Reed and Devin emptied their magazines, clearing out the creatures between them and the girl's car. As the last ghoul fell, Reed called out. Come on, get over here. We'll cover you. Reed shouted. Without hesitation, the young woman grabbed her bag, flinging open the door and sprinting towards the SUV a few yards away. Tatum swiftly unlocked the door, allowing her to climb inside before slamming it shut behind her. Tatum hit the gas, accelerating away from the immediate danger and plowing over a few straggling creatures in their path. As they continued along the road, Tatum spotted a turnoff into a small picnic area up ahead, veering off the road to find temporary refuge. Some zombies followed, but he managed to create enough distance to stop safely. Approaching the parking area cautiously, the men remained on guard, scanning the area for any signs of danger. While there were a few cars present, they were devoid of zombies, except for one with an open door. Keep your heads on a swivel. We don't know when that person made a run for it, Tatum cautioned, his voice tense with anticipation. Before he could finish his sentence, Reed spotted a zombie sprinting towards them at full speed. Reacting swiftly, Reed stood up through the sunroof once again, taking aim and dispatching the threat with a single shot. Problem solved, Reed declared, his tone resolute. Still, let's keep watch, Tatum insisted, unwilling to let their guard down. Turning his attention to the young woman, Tatum observed her shaken state. Her shoulder-length blonde hair was matted from hours of cramped living conditions. I'm Tatum. That's Devin and Reed, Tatum introduced, offering a reassuring smile despite the situation. The young woman, Kelsey, stared at a water bottle sitting in the cup holder, her gaze fixated on it with longing. Tatum noticed her thirst and handed it back to her, watching as she began to drink quickly. Eventually, he had to pull the bottle away from her mouth. Pace yourself, girl. We have plenty of it, Tatum advised gently. Kelsey nodded, taking a moment to catch her breath before speaking. Her voice was slightly raspy from the lack of water over the past couple of days. I'm Kelsey. Thank you for stopping. I didn't think I was ever getting out of that car. She introduced herself gratefully. Tatum listened intently as Kelsey recounted her ordeal. What happened? Why were you parked on the side of the road like that? He inquired. Kelsey sighed, shaking her head in frustration. Long story short, it was because I was stupid and listened to people I shouldn't have. When things started going bad, the police came around, telling us that if we were healthy and could get out of town, to do so. They said to come down here and just park and wait. I guess they thought they could clear the area of those people, and we could come back home, she explained. Guessing that didn't happen, Devin remarked dryly. No, it didn't. My gut told me to keep driving, but I didn't. I figured there would be safety in numbers. I got that one wrong, Kelsey admitted ruefully. If it's any consolation, you weren't the only one who got that wrong, Tatum reassured her. I'm still confused. I don't understand why you were on the side of the road just now, Reed admitted. Well, Reed, I sat there for hours, listening to the radio as long as it was on. Then it went down about the time the sun did. The car was locked up tight, so the only thing to do was sleep, Kelsey explained wearily. Kelsey took a deep breath her words heavy with the weight of the harrowing tale she was recounting. A couple of hours later, I heard screaming. It took me a moment to get my bearings, but once I did, I saw things I'll never be able to unsee, she began, her voice trembling with distress. This kid, couldn't have been more than eight, was ripping his mother's throat out with his teeth. Like some kind of feral animal, some of the other people got out of their cars and ran to help and it went about as well as you could imagine. One right after the other, they fell, then got back up. Some people tried to drive off, and some made it. Others were like me, driving cars that weren't exactly made for the off-road experience, Kelsey continued, her eyes distant as she recalled the horror. I do seem to remember it raining for a few days before this kicked off, Devin interjected. Yep, near record rainfall and three of my four tires were on grass. I tried everything I could to get traction, but it didn't work. Then one of the guys trying to escape clipped my bumper, pushing me further off the road. 
After that, I knew I had no chance. So I got comfortable, hoping those things would get bored and wander off. But they didn't, Kelsey concluded, her voice filled with resignation. Well, I'm glad we came along when we did, Tatum remarked, his tone filled with genuine relief. Me too. I drank the last of the water yesterday morning. I wouldn't have lasted too much longer. So thank you, Kelsey expressed her gratitude sincerely. It's our pleasure, Tatum replied, offering a reassuring smile. So what are you guys doing out here anyway? Kelsey inquired, curiosity evident in her voice. We're headed up towards Eddyville to see if we can help some people up there, Tatum explained. Well, out of the frying pan and into the fire. Still, I'll take what I can get, Kelsey remarked. Kelsey let out a sigh realizing that she wasn't being rescued so much as being picked up along the way towards something more dangerous. Is there anything I can do? She asked, her tone tinged with resignation. Keep your head down and not die. Tatum replied half-jokingly. Kelsey cracked a smile, giving a playful wink and a nod. That I can do quite well. Okay, we're off then, Tatum announced, shifting the SUV into gear. With a sense of determination, they drove back down the driveway towards the highway, the group preparing for the next battle that lay ahead. Chapter 5 Tatum guided the SUV towards the docks, a few miles away. Along the way, they passed abandoned cars and scattered zombies. Some of the undead tried to chase after them but couldn't keep up, moving at a pace between a sprinter and a shambler. As the number of zombies increased, Kelsey's fear became evident. Reed noticed her unease and reassured her, saying, Don't worry. If it's too bad up here, we're going to retreat. We're not going to take any unnecessary risks. Kelsey nodded, forcing a smile, and they focused ahead as they passed the sign for the docks. Get your game faces on, Tatum commanded. See if you can find an overlook, Devin added. Tatum agreed and turned the SUV onto the driveway leading to the docks. As they rounded a corner, chaos unfolded before them. The docks were a mess of abandoned vehicles and roaming zombies. Some of the undead creatures noticed the approaching SUV and began to close in, banging against the vehicle. On the right side of the lot, the general store was under siege by a group of zombies, struggling to break inside. All three men in the SUV shook their heads, realizing the situation was dire. Get us out of here, man. We can't handle this, Devin urged. Tatum nodded and pressed the accelerator, running over a couple of zombies blocking their path. But as he tried to turn the vehicle, a grinding noise came from the front passenger side. What the hell is that? Reed exclaimed. Tatum pushed the accelerator harder, but the SUV remained stuck, the back tires screeching. Shit, Devin muttered as he looked out the window. What is it? Tatum asked. One of those things is caught up in the wheel, Devin replied, his tone grave. Tatum hastily shifted the vehicle into reverse, attempting to dislodge the trapped creature, but their efforts proved futile. The tires screeched, but the SUV remained stationary. Reed surveyed the scene from both sides of the back seat, noting the increasing number of approaching creatures. If we don't move soon, we're not going to have the chance Reed warned urgently. Where are we going? These things are everywhere, Devin exclaimed, his voice tinged with urgency. Kelsey glanced towards the store and spotted someone in the window, gesturing towards the back of the building. Look at the store, she exclaimed, drawing the men's attention. Tatum wasted no time in issuing orders. Unload on them and let's move. Tatum popped up through the sunroof while Devin and Reed began firing through the windows, disregarding the need to roll them down in the urgency of the moment. Bullets tore through the skulls of the zombies at close range as Tatum positioned himself on top of the vehicle, targeting the fastest moving threats. After several intense moments of gunfire, they created a brief opening. Tatum continued to fire from his elevated position, directing the others. Move now. He commanded, urgency lacing his voice. Tatum continued to fire relentlessly as Reed, Devin, and Kelsey disembarked from the vehicle, 
Positioned between the two militia members, Kelsey used them as a shield as they hastened toward the store. Tatum discharged a few more rounds, aiding in their path clearance before leaping from the roof to join them on the ground. With single-minded determination, Tatum sprinted forward, disregarding the pursuing ghouls, focused solely on reaching the store. The path ahead teemed with dozens of creatures, and despite their efforts to dispatch them while on the move, it seemed that for every foe they felled, two more took its place. Leading the charge, Devin surged ahead, his rifle blazing as he fired as rapidly as his fingers could manage. Though he endeavored to take careful aim, the sheer number of adversaries before him meant that merely keeping his weapon at head level was likely to result in casualties. Guiding the group toward the right flank of the store, Devin steered clear of the dense mass of the mob. Yet even there, a dozen creatures still barred their path to safety, standing as a formidable obstacle between them and the back of the store. He emptied the remaining bullets from his magazine before lowering his shoulder and barreling through a few creatures, sending them sprawling far enough for the others to pass through. Devin swiftly took over, engaging the next adversary by deflecting the zombie's arms aside, executing a swift spin that propelled the creature forward. Maintaining his grip on the man's shirt, Devin used him as a human battering ram, plowing through several more ghouls before casting the zombie to the ground. At last, they reached the side of the building, with nothing but clear pavement stretching out before them. They better have that door opened, Devin remarked, his tone tense with urgency. Devin dashed toward the rear of the store, deftly reloading his rifle as he rounded the corner. His momentum faltered abruptly upon encountering six creatures clamoring at the back door, desperate to breach its defenses. Without hesitation, he raised his rifle and unleashed a frenzied barrage, expending half the magazine to obliterate the immediate threat. Rushing to the door, he pounded on it with all his might. We're back here. Let us in. Devin's voice reverberated with urgency as he continued to hammer on the door, while Reed and Tatum took aim, unleashing a volley of shots at the encroaching mob, which numbered well over a hundred and was steadily increasing, the nearest creature within fifteen yards of their position. Persisting in his efforts to gain entry, Devin's pounding grew more frantic, his voice blending with the crescendo of gunfire behind him. After several tense moments, the sound of locks being unlatched reached his ears. With a surge of relief, Devin flung the door open wide, his emotions bordering on rage as he yelled, We're in. The others retreated into the safety of the building, their weapons still firing as the creatures closed in around the back corner. Tatum seized the door and slammed it shut, bracing it while Reed swiftly secured the locks. Panting heavily, everyone took a moment to catch their breath, grateful to be sheltered within the confines of the store. Their attention turned to the civilians who had granted them refuge. A young couple huddled together in the corner, visibly shaken. An older man named Carl, clutching a shovel stained with dried blood, and a middle-aged woman with dark hair named Jamie, who approached them with a salty demeanor, speaking with a hint of attitude. Just what in the Sam hell are you boys doing out there? Are you out of your minds? Jamie demanded. Well, believe it or not, this is a rescue mission, Devin replied. Jamie chuckled, her disbelief evident as she shook her head. I feel so much safer now. Just who in the hell are you? She questioned. I'm Tatum, that's Reed, Devin, and Kelsey. We're part of a militia group just down the road in St. Mary's, Tatum explained. Militia from St. Mary's? Are you shitting me? Jamie retorted incredulously. No, I am not shitting you. Some of the people in your group floated down to us this morning and told us you were here, Tatum insisted. Nash, Carl interjected. The very same, Tatum confirmed. I knew that boy was still alive. Did anybody else make it? Because we saw the two cars go into the water, Carl inquired. Everybody but his sister, Tatum revealed solemnly. Carl paused, his expression heavy with grief as he dropped his head and shook it. That poor girl. She didn't deserve that fate, Carl lamented. None of us did, Carl. Yet yeah, here we are. At least we have more company, Jamie remarked, her tone tinged with resignation. Go easy on them, Jamie. 
They didn't cause this mess. Come on, boys, let me give you the tour, Carl suggested, extending an invitation to the newcomers. The group trailed behind Carl and the others as they entered the main area of the store. At the front windows, they had piled up boxes, displays, and anything heavy to reinforce the defenses against the encroaching threat. Despite the makeshift barricades, numerous zombies still roamed outside, particularly surrounding the trapped cars. So how are we getting out of this one? Reed queried, his tone laced with concern. Still working on that, Tatum replied, his gaze fixed on the scene unfolding beyond the window. As you can see, we've been living pretty sparsely the last few days, Jamie interjected, gesturing towards the relatively bare surroundings. But at least we're better off than those people stuck in their cars, Carl added somberly. Why haven't they tried driving off? Devin inquired. Probably for the same reason you didn't drive back out of here. Pushing through that many of those things isn't that easy. Plus, they watched Nash and then try it. Put a bad taste in their mouths, I suppose, Jamie explained. A couple more tried, but they ended up like your vehicle. Rather than risk it, they sat tight and hoped someone would come along, Carl added. Are you still in touch with them? Tatum inquired. A few of them. We got up to the roof and threw some walkie-talkies to the cars closest to us. And we have a bullhorn, but that's just one way, Carl replied. Okay, I can work with that, Tatum said, his mind already racing with possibilities. You got a plan? Reed asked eagerly. Starting to. Carl, can you show me the roof access? Tatum requested, taking charge of the situation. Carl gestured towards the back corner of the room, where a ladder was propped up, leading to a hatch. Tatum, Carl, and Devin wasted no time in climbing up, eager to gain a bird's-eye view of the situation unfolding below. As they reached the edge of the roof and peered down at the parking lot, they were met with a daunting sight. Cars packed tightly together, interspersed with hordes of zombies. The creatures, having temporarily dispersed from the front of the store, seemed to have returned to the vehicles, creating a chaotic scene below. I don't suppose you brought enough bullets for all of those things, did you? Carl remarked dryly, his gaze fixed on the mass of undead milling about. We didn't, but the more we shoot, the more we risk attracting unwanted attention, Tatum replied thoughtfully. So what are you thinking, Tatum? Devin inquired, his curiosity piqued. Tatum paused, mulling over his thoughts before a sly smile spread across his face. Nothing we're going to like. But I think it'll work. Chapter 6 Tatum and Reed stood atop the building, their gazes fixed upon the sea of creatures swarming the parking lot below. Half of them seemed to be zeroed in on their location, while the other half milled around the parked cars. Moments later, Devin ascended to join them, a backpack slung over his shoulder and a grumpy expression etched on his face. Are you ready to do this, Devin? Tatum inquired. Yeah, but just for the record, I think this is a shit idea, Devin replied, his tone laden with skepticism. The idea is sound, and I gave you a chance to throw out a better idea, Tatum defended. Yeah, the plan is fine, but my part in it is shit, Devin retorted. That's what you get for throwing rock instead of scissors, Reed chimed in, earning a glare from Devin before he cracked a smile and strode toward the back of the building to prepare. Near the edge of the rooftop lay a ladder, poised and ready to be deployed. How much time do you need to get in position? Tatum inquired. Five minutes to get there and light the fuse. Another minute after that before it pops off. And probably another five minutes or so to get to the meetup, Devin explained. Don't worry, we won't leave without you, Tatum assured him. You better not. I know where you live, Devin warned with a smirk. Tatum emitted a soft chuckle, though Devin didn't reciprocate. Nodding, Tatum watched as Devin departed to prepare while he reached for the bullhorn. Positioning himself to address the occupants of the cars below, he raised the device to his lips and pressed the button. After a brief pause, a five-second siren pierced the air, aimed at capturing everyone's attention. Hey everybody, I know the situation looks dire, 
Tatum's voice echoed through the bullhorn. But if you follow my instructions, we will get you out of this, I promise. Now, this is a multi-part plan, so please listen carefully. He paused, allowing his words to sink in before continuing. We are going to have to set a diversion if you're going to be able to drive out of here safely. So when I give the signal, I want you all to lay on your horns for 60 seconds. After that, I want you to cover yourself with whatever you have in the car and stay as still as you can. These things aren't that bright, so hopefully if they don't see movement, they'll lose interest. Tatum paused again, letting the gravity of the situation settle among the listeners. Now, Carl has told me that some of your cars have become disabled. If you are one of those vehicles, I want you to give me a quick honk right now. A moment later, four cars emitted a small honk, stirring agitation among the creatures nearby but providing Tatum with valuable information. Okay, if you heard that horn and the car is next to you, when we clear the path, I want you to let those people hitch a ride. I will be up here, and I'm one hell of a shot so if there are any stragglers, I will take them out. Tatum paused again, so that his words resonated with the listeners below. I know it may be tight and uncomfortable, but once we get down the road, we can spread out again. The most important thing right now is getting away from this mob. Nobody gets left behind. Another pause followed as Tatum glanced back at Devin and Reed, confirming their readiness. Once we clear the creatures, and once everybody is loaded up, I want you all to head out to the highway and head south. There are creatures along the road, but they're spread out, and you should be able to drive right on by them. Keep going for about 15 miles until you hit a bridge with a camper across it. Stay there until we arrive. Everybody give me a honk to let me know you understand. The air reverberated with the cacophony of car horns, filling the momentary silence before tapering off into quietude. Tatum glanced back at his comrades, giving them a subtle nod signaling their impending action. Reed raised a single finger, indicating for Tatum to wait. With his rifle aimed towards the ground, Reed discharged several shots to clear the path for Devin. Upon finishing, he glanced back at Tatum and gave a thumbs-up sign of approval. Okay, lay on those horns now, Tatum commanded. Instantly, the parking lot was inundated with the blaring chorus of car horns, a deafening symphony of annoyance. Tatum retreated from the ledge but maintained his gaze outward, observing as the zombies congregating around the cars began to shift, leaving the building in pursuit of the noise. Glancing back at Reed, who signaled the all-clear, Tatum responded with a motion to proceed. Without hesitation, Reed seized the ladder and swung it over the edge. As soon as it made contact with the ground, Devin wasted no time in descending, swiftly making his way to the ground below. As soon as his feet touched the ground, Devin wasted no time, propelling himself forward with determined strides away from the store. The distant crack of gunfire echoed behind him, signaling Reed's efforts to eliminate any lingering threats not enticed by the blaring car horns. Devin's objective lay ahead, a pedestrian footbridge half a mile away on the opposite side of a small wooded area. As he approached the trees, the fading car horns revealed the haunting moans of approaching zombies. Drawing his handgun, Devin's gaze intensified as he focused on the dense foliage ahead. The trees stretched for about 50 yards, their thick canopy obstructing visibility to the other side. Movement caught his eye, a telltale sign of the encroaching undead. Shit, that figures, Devin muttered under his breath. Devin dashed into the woods, just as a zombie emerged from the shadows. Without hesitation, he raised his gun and fired, the bullet finding its mark and piercing the creature's skull. The sudden gunshot attracted the attention of a dozen other undead lurking among the trees, their vacant stares fixated on the living prey before them. As a result of their slow and clumsy movements, Devin remained on edge as he evaded their grasp, his senses heightened by the imminent danger. However, his apprehension escalated when he detected the sound of rapid footsteps approaching through the underbrush. Alert and agile, Devin scanned his surroundings, searching for the source of the noise. His gaze darted to the right just in time to witness a sprinting zombie plow through a couple of its companions in its fervent pursuit. Reacting swiftly, Devin sidestepped the charging ghoul, 
narrowly avoiding its grasp as it collided with a nearby tree. Seizing the opportunity, he pivoted and aimed his gun, but the resilient undead swiftly recovered and resumed its relentless advance, closing the distance between them with alarming speed. The shot grazed the zombie's head as it lunged at Devin, its grip tightening around him, threatening to bring him down. In a desperate move, Devin pivoted, using the momentum to lift the creature off its feet and slam it forcefully to the ground, knowing he would go down with it. The impact was jarring, enough to crack a few of the zombie's ribs, but Devin was too consumed by adrenaline to feel the pain. The undead thrashed violently, attempting to overpower him, but Devin fought back with ferocity, refusing to yield. With a swift motion, Devin managed to push the creature's arms aside long enough to press his handgun against its chest, the barrel aimed upward. Without hesitation, he pulled the trigger, the bullet tearing through the bottom of the zombie's chin. As the lifeless body collapsed, Devin swiftly redirected his attention to the approaching threats, unleashing a barrage of gunfire to ward off any creatures encroaching too closely. Once the immediate danger was quelled, he sprang to his feet and resumed his desperate sprint through the woods. It took Devin a few more tense minutes of running before he finally reached the safety of the pedestrian bridge, relieved to find it free of any lurking creatures. Without wasting a moment, Devin hurried across the bridge, descending to the ground and swiftly removing the backpack from his shoulders. Opening it with practiced urgency, he retrieved his lighter and flicked it on, his heart pounding in his chest. Inside the bag lay an improvised explosive device crafted from various items scavenged from the nearby general store. Though it lacked the potency to cause significant damage, Devin knew it would certainly create enough noise to serve as a distraction. Come on, light damn it, Devin muttered through gritted teeth, willing the flame to ignite the fuse. It took a tense moment for the fuse to catch, Devin's ears filled with the haunting moans of the approaching zombies as he frantically worked to ignite it. Finally, with a spark, the fuse sputtered to life, its glow signaling the impending explosion. All right, I'm out of here, Devin declared, turning on his heels and sprinting away, knowing he had a long distance to cover. Moments later, a deafening explosion reverberated behind him, accompanied by a fiery eruption that painted the sky. All right, Tatum, it's your show. Don't leave my ass behind, he muttered under his breath. Meanwhile, Tatum and Reed stood on the rooftop, observing the fiery display with a mixture of tension and determination. The explosion rattled the windows of the building, signaling the success of Devin's diversion. That should get their attention, Tatum remarked, his grip tightening on his rifle. We just have to hope that it's enough, Reed responded, a note of apprehension in his voice. I'll keep watch up here. Get down there and be ready to move, Tatum instructed. With a nod, Reed descended back into the store, while Tatum positioned himself near the front, staying low and moving cautiously. Much to his relief, the plan seemed to be working flawlessly as the creatures began to shuffle away from the cars, drawn by the allure of the explosion. Come on, you bastards, keep moving, Tatum muttered under his breath, urging the undead horde to continue their retreat. Damn it, Tatum cursed under his breath as he observed the handful of zombies stubbornly clinging to one vehicle, refusing to heed the diversion. Despite the urgency of the situation, Tatum opted to wait a couple of minutes, hoping that the majority of the mob would eventually disperse. However, the five creatures circling the car remained resolute in their fixation. Faced with a dilemma, Tatum contemplated his options. Shooting them would only draw attention back to their location accelerating the return of the horde they had just managed to divert. This is such a bad idea, he muttered to himself. With a decisive resolve, Tatum sprinted towards the back of the building, descending the exterior ladder with rapid efficiency. As soon as his feet touched the ground, he wasted no time in charging towards the creatures, drawing his knife as he ran, prepared to confront the lingering threat head-on. Rather than opting for a cautious approach, Tatum charged headlong into the midst of the fray. With swift and decisive movements, he thrust his knife into the back of one zombie's skull, swiftly withdrawing it and plunging it into the next creature's head before they could react. Using his momentum, Tatum pressed against the back of one zombie, 
forcefully shoving it into another undead assailant, pinning them against the car. As the creature struggled against his grasp, a new threat emerged from the front of the vehicle, lurching towards him. Before the approaching zombie could reach him, a nearby driver emerged from their car, brandishing a baseball bat with determined purpose. With a powerful swing, the driver struck the creature in the face, staggering it before delivering a decisive blow to finish it off as it fell to the ground. Acknowledging the assist with a nod, Tatum swiftly redirected his attention to dispatching the remaining two zombies with his blade. He quickly brought them down, throwing their lifeless bodies to the ground in a heap, ensuring the immediate area was once again safe from the undead threat. The driver approached Tatum, reaching for the door of the car. Appreciate your help, Tatum acknowledged gratefully. We appreciate yours. Go take care of what you need to take care of. I'll get them into my car. I have plenty of room, the driver offered, gesturing towards the vehicle. Tatum nodded in agreement and swiftly made his way back to the store, his heart still racing with adrenaline. Reed emerged from the front door, shaking his head in amazement. Well, that was bold, Reed remarked, his tone a mixture of admiration and incredulity. Had to be done. Couldn't risk gunshots, Tatum replied firmly. I'm not criticizing. It was a ballsy play, Reed conceded. As they stood there, Carl and Jamie emerged from the store, heading towards the trucks parked nearby. They quickly started them up and maneuvered them to the front of the building. I'll help them load up. Keep a watch on our six, Tatum instructed Reed, who nodded in response. Both men turned their attention back to the parking lot, observing as the people began to move into the waiting vehicles, forming a makeshift caravan that soon departed down the highway. Good work, Reed complimented as he headed off to secure their rear position. Tatum took a moment to reflect on the successful outcome, nodding to himself with a sense of satisfaction. What do you know? That actually worked, he mused, a hint of surprise in his voice. Chapter 7 Tatum and the others hurried to fill the trucks with everything they could carry. As they loaded the final boxes of food, the sharp cracks of gunfire erupted from behind the store, sending shivers down their spines. Get those last boxes in, Tatum instructed. I'm going to go check on the situation. Jamie and Carl nodded in agreement as Tatum snatched his rifle and dashed out the door, veering toward the back of the store. The scene unfolded before him, a horde of creatures, several dozen strong, shuffling ominously in their direction. Without hesitation, Reed opened fire, taking down several of the creatures as they encroached within 30 yards. With each precise shot, he maintained a steady rhythm, swiftly dispatching any that crossed his mental boundary. Tatum rushed to assist, rifle poised, but Reed waved him off. I've got it under control. Go get loaded up. I'll call if I need backup. We're nearly finished, Tatum replied determinedly. Let's take out a few more and then we'll be ready to roll. Reed nodded in agreement as both of them turned and unleashed a barrage of gunfire, swiftly neutralizing half a dozen zombies within seconds, leaving the nearest shambler a considerable 50 yards away from the rear of the store. They made their way to the front, where the others were already loaded up. Carl gestured for them to join him in his extended cab truck. Come on, boys, got plenty of room for you over here, Carl called out. Jamie assumed the driver's seat of her truck, with the young couple and Kelsey piling in as well. We'll see you at the bridge when you get there, Jamie announced confidently. We just have to pick up Devin. We won't be far behind, Tatum assured her. She nodded before revving up her truck and speeding away. Tatum and Reed climbed into Carl's truck, Tatum opting for the front seat. So where are we picking up your man? Carl inquired. There's a road sign about half a mile down the road, Tatum replied. I know the one you're talking about. Hang on, Carl said. Carl wasted no time, pushing the pedal to the metal. Despite the truck's heavy load, the tires screeched against the asphalt. Tatum and Reed exchanged impressed nods, acknowledging Carl's skill behind the wheel. This truck doesn't mess around, Tatum remarked, impressed. When you get to be my age, you learn to appreciate and enjoy life, Carl replied with a grin. 
always wanted something that could go from 0 to 60 in a matter of seconds. So I got one about 6 months ago. Best decision I ever made, and I don't just mean because of the whole end of the world thing. Both Tatum and Reed chuckled in agreement as Carl beamed with pride. It didn't take long for them to reach the road sign, where Carl pulled over to allow Devin to climb in, settling into the back seat beside Reed. How'd it go? Tatum inquired. I had a close encounter with one of those runners, but other than that, it went well, Devin replied. So where am I headed, boys? Carl asked, ready to navigate the next leg of their journey. Just straight down the highway, Carl. Watch yourself for the next couple of miles. Those things are wandering around, Tatum advised. Appreciate the heads up, Carl acknowledged. They drove in silence for several moments, their eyes scanning the road for any signs of trouble. The only notable presence was the creature shambling along in pursuit of the convoy, some struggling to rise after presumably being knocked down by the fleeing vehicles. So Carl, what's your story? Reed finally broke the silence. What do you want to know? Carl replied. Like, what did you do before all this? Reed inquired further. Believe it or not, I ran the biggest hardware store in Hayden, Carl revealed. No kidding? Reed responded, intrigued. No kidding. My father started it after the war back in the 40s, and I took it over after he retired, Carl explained. It's always good to see mom and pop shops fighting the good fight against the Supercenter, Reed remarked. Oh yeah, we kicked the hell out of the Supercenter when they came to town. We treated our people right, and they kept coming to us. Their hardware and garden center was so unprofitable that after a year they turned it into a car mechanic bay, Carl reminisced proudly. Good job, Carl, Reed commended. Yeah, we kicked the hell out of the Supercenter. Then the government came and kicked our asses, Carl's tone shifted, bitterness seeping into his words. What are you talking about? Reed asked, puzzled. I'm talking about when they sent their soldier boys a few days ago and completely cleaned out my store, Carl revealed, his voice tinged with frustration and loss. The militia men exchanged confused glances, uncertain of what to make of Carl's revelation. Why in the world would they do that? Tatum questioned, his brow furrowing in disbelief. Yeah, did they give you a reason? Devin added, his expression mirroring Tatum's confusion. Most of the boys just kept their mouths shut and looted my stuff. But this one prick, Corporal Jackson or something stupid like that, told me that they needed the material for some stadium project, Carl recounted, his frustration evident in his tone. The trio shared puzzled looks trying to make sense of the situation. The stadium project? Did they say anything else? Tatum pressed for more information. Nope, just that the stadium needed my stuff, and they were taking it, Carl replied tersely. What did they take? Surely they didn't loot the whole store, Reed interjected. They didn't, but it was pretty much all of my seeds, potting soil, pots, and greenhouse materials. Lights, glass, you name it, Carl listed off, his frustration growing palpable. The men huddled together, discussing the perplexing situation as if assembling the pieces of a puzzle without knowing if they had all the pieces. Obviously, they're trying to create a sustainable food supply. But for what? We know the military retreated from Spokane and other places. I can't imagine they don't have greenhouse material where they're headed, Tatum mused aloud, it could be for some place here or in Seattle, Reed suggested. But why? If they're retreating, then why would they be leaving behind a settlement? Tatum pondered. What if it's for important people that they couldn't get out? Devin proposed. Tatum and Reed shared a curious glance before directing their attention back to Devin. What kind of important people? Tatum inquired, intrigued by Devin's theory. A lot of damn people are dying, and not just throwaways like us. People that know how to do important stuff. Doctors, scientists, lawyers. Well, maybe not lawyers. Anyway, I assume at some point that rebuilding is going to happen once this is over. It would make sense that they would want to have the brainpower to do it, Devin explained, his words painting a sobering picture of the future. 
That's a good theory. But if it's true, this whole situation just got a lot scarier, Reed remarked, his tone grave. How do you mean? Devin asked, puzzled. Because if the government or military went to that trouble, they must believe this isn't going to be a flash in the pan. Whatever is happening is here to stay, which means we need to start thinking long-term, Reed elaborated, his expression reflecting the weight of their predicament. Well, that's depressing as hell to think about, Devin remarked, his voice heavy with resignation. Carl, I don't suppose you have a warehouse with greenhouse materials, do you? Tatum asked. I don't, but my manufacturer was up in Pinehurst, Carl replied. Pinehurst, why does that sound familiar? Devin questioned. It's about 20 miles to the east, right on the interstate, Carl explained. This old-timer like me, Eddie Jenkins, had a warehouse where he cranked this stuff out. Apparently, there were a few of those hippie communes in the area that loved his stuff. My customers loved it too. And, well, guess the military did too. Could his warehouse still be there? Or would the military have raided that too? Tatum inquired. I'd be shocked if they knew where to find it. He had more business than he could handle, so he didn't advertise. Don't even think he had a sign on the building, Carl revealed. If we can get that, might go a long way towards setting us up for the long haul, Devin remarked. Carl, do you know where the warehouse is? Tatum pressed. Oh yeah, I'd pick stuff up there on the regular. If you get me to Pinehurst, I can show you where, Carl confirmed. Looks like we got us a plan, Tatum declared, a sense of determination creeping into his voice. First things first, we gotta get these people back to town safely, Devin reminded them, refocusing their attention on the immediate task at hand. Devin pointed out the front windshield, where everybody was congregating on the bridge. Tatum glanced over at Reed with a mischievous glint in his eye. Looks like you're up, Tatum teased. Ah, hell. Reed grumbled, preparing to exit the truck, but Carl intervened. I'm guessing by the tone of your voice that you were having trouble with that big boy, Carl observed. More than you know, Reed admitted with a sigh of frustration. Well, hell, give me the keys. I'll take care of it for you. I've driven enough trucks that big over the years. You just tell me where you want it, Carl offered generously. Reed's face lit up with relief as he handed over the keys. Just far enough back so that we can slip through to the other side, Reed instructed, grateful for Carl's assistance. Yeah, we want to keep it there to prevent too many of those things from coming at it down the highway, Tatum added. I got you covered. Tatum, why don't you slide over here behind the wheel? She's powerful, but she's a lady, so you treat her nice, Carl directed with a smile. Yes, sir. Tatum replied respectfully. The trio observed as Carl made his way toward the camper to move it out of the way while Tatum took the driver's seat. As they waited, their conversation continued. Have we had any contact with Pinehurst? Tatum inquired. Not to my knowledge. If it's right on the interstate, it's possible they got overrun, Reed replied. As callous as it sounds, that might actually be better for us. We can move those things where we need them to be so that we can get what we need, Devin suggested. I hate to say it, but Devin is right, Reed reluctantly admitted. Still, let's assume that there are people there. When we get back to town, I want the full strike team assembled and ready to go. I also want a couple of moving trucks gassed up with able-bodied men. Regardless of what's up there, we're most likely going to be on the clock. The quicker we can get loaded up, the better off we'll be. Tatum said. Both Reed and Devin nodded in agreement as they observed Carl effortlessly maneuvering the giant camper. Reed couldn't help but shake his head in amazement while Devin and Tatum exchanged amused glances, struggling to contain their laughter. Oh, shut the hell up, like you two would have done any better, Reed retorted with a playful smirk. Both men succumbed to their laughter, unable to hold it in any longer. Finally, the route was clear and they joined the rest of the caravan through. It took Carl a moment to maneuver the camper back into place and rejoin them. They peered ahead toward the caravan, observing everyone lined up on the right side of the road, waiting patiently. What in the hell are they waiting on? 
Carl questioned, puzzled by the delay. Us. We have to show them the way. Tatum explained, realization dawning upon him. Okay, then. Let's get these people home, Carl declared with determination. Carl accelerated, leading the way as they continued down the highway, headed back towards St. Mary's. Chapter 8 In the bustling gymnasium of St. Mary's, Tatum found himself perched on the weathered bleachers, a silent observer of the activity unfolding around him. The influx of newcomers, battered and worn, sought refuge from the scorching sun and the trials of their journey. Among them, Tatum's weariness was palpable as he sat with elbows propped on his knees, the weight of responsibility etched into his features. It was then that his wife, Maggie, appeared, her presence a balm to his troubled soul. She settled beside him, offering a gentle caress to his tense back, a silent reassurance of their unspoken bond. Looks like you made a lot of new friends today, Maggie remarked. A lot of new friends who are going to need food, medicine, and a lot of other stuff that we don't have, Tatum replied wearily, his concerns weighing heavily on his mind. We'll figure it out, we always do, Maggie assured him. I know we will. As a matter of fact, Tatum began, only to be interrupted by Maggie's knowing gaze. You're about to head out again, she stated matter-of-factly. Who told? Tatum questioned, a hint of amusement in his voice. I saw your buddies loading up the trucks, Maggie confessed with a knowing smile. I swear I was going to tell you before we left, Tatum admitted sheepishly, his gaze dropping to the floor. I know you would have. Because you know what would happen if you didn't, Maggie replied, her smile widening as Tatum's laughter filled the air, momentarily dispelling the tension that hung between them. But two field trips in one day. You know, it would be nice to have you home for longer than a meal and a nap, Maggie teased gently, her words tinged with longing. Soon, I promise, Tatum vowed earnestly. I'm going to hold you to that, even if I have to handcuff you to the bed, Maggie threatened playfully, a mischievous glint in her eyes. If you did handcuff me to the bed, I'm not sure how much rest I'd be getting, Tatum quipped, his smile returning as their shared laughter echoed through the gym. Maggie's playful slap landed on Tatum's arm, a silent reprimand for his suggestive remark amidst the crowd. Be quiet. All these people. She chided, her eyes dancing with mischief. They all know. They see that caged sex panther behind those eyes, Tatum retorted with a grin, earning himself another, slightly firmer smack from Maggie. Yet, the gesture remained lighthearted, a testament to the easy rapport between them. Tatum's laughter bubbled forth, and he leaned into her, finding solace in her warmth as he rested his head upon her shoulder. How did I get so lucky to land you as a wife? He mused aloud, his voice soft with affection. I don't know, but just remember that you are damn lucky, Maggie replied, her tone tender yet teasing. Their laughter filled the air, a melody of shared joy that momentarily overshadowed the weight of their responsibilities. However, their private moment was interrupted as Reed entered the gym. We're ready to roll out when you are, Tatum, Reed announced. Let's get this done, Tatum replied, rising from his seat with purpose. Yet, before he could make his exit, Reed halted him with a raised hand. What are you doing? Reed inquired, his brow furrowed in confusion. Heading out? Tatum questioned, puzzled by Reed's interruption. Without kissing your wonderful wife goodbye, Reed clarified. Tatum's glare toward Reed softened into a wry smile as both men redirected their attention to Maggie, who was grinning like a mischievous schoolgirl. With a tender gesture, Tatum leaned down to plant a heartfelt kiss on her lips before straightening up. Reed glanced over at Maggie, acknowledging her with a nod of gratitude. Thanks for the assist, Reed, she quipped, her tone tinged with amusement. I swear, Maggie, I'm doing everything I can to get him properly trained, Reed responded with a chuckle, his gaze shifting to Tatum. You still have a little work to do, but he's getting better, Maggie remarked playfully her laughter mingling with Reed's as Tatum shook his head in mock exasperation. The two men exited the gym, greeted by the eager squad and Carl, 
who stood ready for the journey ahead. Carl, you know you don't have to come with us. You showed us where it is, Tatum offered, his gratitude evident in his words. You didn't have to come all the way up to Eddieville to save our asses. Feels like the least I can do. Besides, if old Eddie is there, seeing a friendly face might grease the wheels, Carl replied with a shrug. Okay, good enough for me. Let's ride out, Tatum declared. As the convoy set off, the SUVs leading the way, two moving vans trailed behind, carrying a handful of men ready for whatever lay ahead. Their journey out of town was marked by the quiet hum of the engines and the steady rhythm of the road beneath them. The drive to Pinehurst proved uneventful, the small highway winding its way through a serene landscape of towering trees and endless blue skies. Occasionally, a glimpse of wildlife darted across their path, but there was no sign of the undead menace that haunted their world. As they neared the interstate, Tatum signaled for the trucks to halt. Parking the SUV beside the moving trucks, he leaned out the window to address the occupants. Okay, guys, stay here while we go check it out. Stay on your radios, and we'll let you know where to come. If you don't hear from us in two hours, I want you to turn and head back to town. Tell Maggie what happened, and she'll know what to do, Tatum instructed, his voice firm with authority. The driver of the truck nodded in acknowledgement as Tatum led the two SUVs onward, their headlights cutting through the fading light of day as they approached the interstate. As they reached their destination, a troubling sight greeted them. Hundreds of zombies crowded the main road above, their forms obscured by the dense foliage of the surrounding trees. Some were clustered to the right, while others aimlessly roamed the area. Well, this just got more difficult, Reed remarked grimly, his gaze fixed on the horde above. Not necessarily. Check that out, Carl interjected, pointing towards something in the distance. Carl's pointed finger directed everyone's attention to a modestly sized, hand-painted sign near the intersection. Its message, visitors' entrance two miles, accompanied by an arrow pointing eastward, elicited a collective exchange of puzzled glances among the vehicle's occupants. Looks like whoever is here managed to ride out the storm, Reed observed, his voice tinged with cautious optimism. Still, keep your head on a swivel. I'm not sure if I like this or not, Tatum cautioned, his grip tightening on the steering wheel as he navigated towards the indicated direction. Reed readied his rifle, his eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of danger as Tatum veered onto the frontage road. Above them, the interstate loomed, its once bustling lanes now blocked by a strategic arrangement of school buses and cars, forming an impenetrable barrier against the encroaching horde. Somebody knew what they were doing. I don't think those things are getting through that, Reed remarked, a hint of admiration in his tone. As they continued down the side road, makeshift barricades came into view, obstructing every path into the town. Approaching the designated visitor's entrance, they followed the sign's direction to the left, only to be met with yet another blockade and several armed guards poised for action. Instinctively, the guards raised their weapons at their approach, prompting Tatum to bring the vehicle to a halt. Everybody sit tight. Nobody makes a move unless they shoot me, Tatum declared, his voice steady despite the tension that hung thick in the air. Tatum stepped out of the vehicle, his arms raised in a gesture of non-aggression. One of the guards approached, his gun at the ready but not pointed directly at Tatum. Welcome to Pinehurst. Now, who are you and what's your business here? The guard inquired, his tone cautious but not hostile. My name's Tatum, and my friends and I are from just down the road in St. Mary's. We're here because we need some specific supplies that we were told were here, Tatum explained, his voice calm yet determined. No offense, Tatum, but we don't really have a lot to spare these days, the guard replied, his expression skeptical. If I'm right, you probably don't even know they're here, Tatum countered. The guard regarded him with a curious gaze before continuing, we're not that big of a town, as you can see. If we haven't found it yet, it's only a matter of time. Before Tatum could press further, Carl disregarded Reed's objections and joined him outside the vehicle. Standing beside Tatum with arms crossed, Carl exuded an air of impatience with the conversation. The guard regarded Carl with suspicion, 
puzzled by his lack of compliance, while Tatum simply shrugged, equally uncertain of Carl's motives. Hey young man, is ol' Eddie Jenkins still alive and kicking? Carl interjected, his tone casual yet purposeful. Who? The guard replied, his brow furrowing in confusion. Eddie Jenkins, he's old enough to make me look young. Had a big old warehouse over on the west side of town, Carl elaborated. As the guard held his hand up momentarily, engaging in a conversation over his radio regarding Eddie, Tatum turned his attention to Carl with a bemused expression. I thought I told you to stay in the car, Tatum chided lightly. You were taking too long, and I gotta take a piss. Figured I'd help, Carl retorted matter-of-factly, his demeanor unapologetic. Tatum couldn't help but crack a smile, shaking his head in amusement, just as the guard spoke up with the news about Eddie. I'm sorry, but Eddie didn't make it. He apparently got sick, the guard informed them solemnly. Well, that figures. He didn't make his last delivery to me despite me paying in advance. Of course he'd kick off before making good on what he owed me, Carl muttered with a hint of bitterness. I'm sorry there's nothing I can do, old-timer, the guard replied, his tone sympathetic yet firm. Sure there is. You can get somebody down here who can make some decisions, and I can go pick up what's mine, Carl insisted, his voice tinged with determination. They're already on the way, but just because you knew Eddie doesn't mean he owed you anything, the guard countered his tone slightly defensive. Undeterred, Carl reached into his pocket, retrieving a piece of paper and waving it in the air for emphasis. I got the invoice right here, dated last week. You can come get it if you want, Carl declared. As the guard motioned for Carl to approach, he handed over the invoice. Meanwhile, Sutton, the leader of the community, a burly middle-aged man with a bushy beard, made his presence known. Okay, what do we have here? Sutton inquired, his tone gruff but not unkind. Some visitors who claim that they're owed something, the guard explained, gesturing towards Tatum and Carl. Oh, my favorite kind of people. We're here to help survivors, not give in to demands, Sutton remarked wryly, his skepticism evident. No demands here, sir. We didn't know anybody was still alive up here, and quite frankly, there's stuff that's most likely sitting in a warehouse that we could use, Tatum clarified, his tone respectful yet firm. Well, don't you think if you could use it, then we could as well? Sutton countered, his gaze piercing as he scrutinized Tatum's words. I have no doubt. Which is why I'm happy to talk about how we can help each other out. Tatum replied diplomatically, his posture relaxed yet determined. Sutton studied the invoice for a moment before comprehension dawned on him, his face breaking into a wide grin. Greenhouse kits? He mused aloud, his eyes alight with understanding. Realization sank in as Sutton nodded with satisfaction. You boys are getting settled in for the long haul, ain't ya? He observed. With everything we've learned in the last few days, I think it would be a good idea if we did. Tatum confirmed, his gaze meeting Sutton's with unwavering resolve. Sutton pondered for a moment before posing a pointed question. Well, it's pretty clear we have something valuable that you want. What do you bring to the table? A significant number of highly trained and heavily armed men, Tatum replied. Sutton's expression hardened, a hint of suspicion coloring his features. Are you threatening me? He demanded, his voice tinged with defiance. Tatum's expression softened, his intent clear as he sought to reassure Sutton. Oh no, not at all. Quite the opposite, actually. We don't know if or when help is going to come, so we have to assume we're on our own. Now it looks like you've done a good job of blocking off the interstate, but it's only a matter of time before those things, or worse, find their way here, Tatum explained earnestly, his voice tinged with concern. Sutton contemplated Tatum's words for a moment, acknowledging the validity of his concerns. So, what do you propose? Sutton inquired, his tone cautious yet receptive. We check out the warehouse, see what kind of supplies we're dealing with. Let us take a negotiated percentage, and I'll dedicate some men and resources to helping you shore up your defense, Tatum suggested, his tone diplomatic yet resolute. I don't know, 
I have people I'm responsible for, and our food supply isn't exactly plentiful, Sutton countered. I understand I have people relying on me too. We just picked up another 40 or so today as a matter of fact, Tatum revealed. What do you mean picked up? Sutton inquired, his curiosity piqued. He means he risked his ass to come rescue the lot of us who were stuck and just waiting to die. This boy here is a good man, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be standing here right now. He's exactly the kind of person you want on your side in the apocalypse, Carl interjected, his voice brimming with admiration for Tatum. Sutton considered Carl's words carefully before nodding in agreement and motioning for Tatum and his companions to come closer. Okay, let's go check out the warehouse. Have your men hang out here if you don't mind, Sutton agreed. Tatum nodded in agreement and turned back to the others, gesturing for them to remain while he and Carl ventured towards the warehouse. With Sutton's car as their transport, they followed Carl's guidance, eventually arriving at a nondescript building just off the main road. Are you sure this is it? I thought this place was abandoned, Sutton questioned skeptically as they approached the structure. Oh, this is the right place, Carl assured him confidently, a hint of anticipation in his voice. Using a crowbar, Tatum broke open the padlock on the gate, allowing them access to the interior. As they entered, the daylight streamed in, revealing a vast workshop filled with pallets of goods, greenhouse supplies and growing materials among them. Well, I'll be damned. That's what I get for assuming, Sutton remarked, his tone tinged with surprise. So what do you say, Sutton? 40% of the supplies, and we help you fortify this place, complete with booby traps and a rotating force to help shore up defenses, Tatum proposed, his voice steady with conviction. I'd like one more thing, Sutton added, his gaze serious as he met Tatum's eyes. Name it, Tatum responded without hesitation. I want some guarantees in a formal plan, that if we do get overrun by man or beast, that you have a place for me and my people to go, Sutton requested, his tone firm. Tatum considered the request for a moment before extending his hand in agreement. You have a deal, he affirmed, sealing the agreement with a firm handshake. I'll call my people and we'll get it loaded up, Tatum declared. Sounds good to me. In the meantime, I'm going to order every building be searched. God only knows what else is in this town. Sutton announced before walking off, his sense of duty evident in his stride. Turning back to the warehouse, Carl and Tatum surveyed the bounty before them, contemplating the possibilities it held. That's a hell of a deal you made, Tatum. It'll take a little time to get set up, but once it's going, it'll be pumping out food, Carl remarked, his tone tinged with admiration. I hope you're right, Carl. I hope you're right, Tatum replied his voice filled with a mix of hope and uncertainty. With a nod, Tatum watched as Carl went to inspect the goods, his mind racing with plans and strategies for the future. Stepping outside, he placed his hands on his hips and gazed up at the sky, the warm sun casting a comforting glow upon his skin. Well, that's one crisis averted. But I swear, I'm not leaving the house tomorrow, Tatum mused aloud to himself, a chuckle escaping his lips as he reflected on the unexpected turn of events. Just a week ago, he had been engaging in target practice at the compound. Now, he found himself on the brink of building his own empire in the midst of the apocalypse. The End